Le 24 février 2022, la Russie envahit l'Ukraine. La vie de millions d'Ukrainiens et d'Ukrainiennes est bouleversée. Aujourd'hui, j'interview Rost. Il est ukrainien et avant la guerre, il faisait partie d'un groupe de musique. Aujourd'hui, il est fixeur. Un fixeur est une personne employée par un ou une journaliste pour faciliter son travail dans une région dangereuse. Merci à lui d'avoir accepté de répondre à toutes mes questions. L'interview s'est déroulée en anglais, donc n'hésitez pas à mettre les sous-titres. Can you please first uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, my name is Rost. Uh, all my life I tried different experiences. I was fond of business. I made some plumber startup uh, three years ago and it was quite famous in Ukraine. Uh, but then I broke up with that and went fully into music. And we made a great rock band that started to be popular before war. But when war started, I understood that I have to be a part of this war, a part of my country, and uh, I tried to find a way uh, to do the best. And I started to work as a fixer with foreign press because I understand that as more people speak about what happens in Ukraine, more help we get from Europe, from USA, and we are very thankful for that. Can you explain to us a little bit uh, what is um, a fixer? Yeah, a fixer, uh, it seems like I understood it all my life because uh, when I was young, I worked as a guide. Uh, but uh, people, foreigners, usually um, made, make me some task like speaking with some business partner in Ukraine and being a translator, uh, helping them to uh, distribute their watches from the USA in Ukrainian market, etc. Some difficult tasks. I had to fix some problem and I understood like I'm not just a guide, I'm a fixer. But then I heard that it's a real profession uh, and uh, it's a man or woman who helps Uh, press to make their tasks to have their photo. Uh, for example, we have a, a journalist and we have a picture and uh, how he appeared near this place to make this picture. This all is the work of fixer. He has to get the permissions uh, to bring him to this place, to organize everything. Uh, and uh, that's my work. So nothing happens in this war without fixers. And nothing, nothing that media talks about this war happens without a fixer. Can you tell me how did you become a, a fixer and when? Uh, first two weeks of war, I was uh, not in Kiev uh, because uh, my friend who knows something about uh, military work, uh, he said that we have to leave Kiev because there will be fights in the city and uh, we have to leave to let soldiers do their work better. And uh, we went to Western Ukraine. It was two worst weeks of my life. Uh, I thought that uh, war made me feel so bad, but truly being not in my city made me feel so bad. And I tried to find a way. And then I had a call from my friend and he said, we are working as fixers here uh, with foreign press. And at the first moment, I felt that, wow, it's great. I feel like it's mine because I'm a good translator. I worked as a guide before. I'm a good driver, etc. But then he says, we get paid 200, 300 euros per day. And I understood, wow, <laughs> that's a super, super idea how I can be useful and paid uh, in this war. So after two weeks, I started uh, from working in Kiev, Bucha. Uh, European direction, but then I started to work all over the front line from Kherson, Donbass to uh, from Kharkiv region, Donbass region to Kherson region, and I have good experience now. Uh, why did you uh, choose to become a fixer and not going to war uh, directly? Mm -hmm. Probably I understand uh, my abilities. Like before war, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, in my startup, there were 250 workers, etc. That I have like some organizing ability. Uh, I was thinking about how I could use it in uh, war, but I didn't find a position and I never worked for somebody. I never had any orders. It's like Miles' style of life. I always make my work by myself. I have to be self-employed. And I understand that it will be really difficult for me in war because I'm not the best shooter. I never had guns in my hands. I'm bad in counter-strike. Um, I'm a good driver, but being just a driver on the front line with soldiers, uh, is it enough for me? Uh, or I'm a good cook, but being just a cook, maybe no, maybe I want to uh, use all my abilities, like the translation, making good interviews, like opening people for their feelings, uh, driving, uh, fixing problems, um, and being lucky. And I understood that like working with press is the best for me. And uh, 
the main thing when you feel the result of your work when you see uh, the results of your work in bbc new york times uh, guardian uh, you feel like wow i'm really i'm really here i'm really in <laughs> how did you learn to be a, a fixer this you can learn only only from your experience and uh, maybe uh, i didn't understand that i'm so good in it uh, but uh, yeah i just started to first to work and then trying to understand what is it first i was just a driver but then i slowly moved uh, to a fixer uh, work i understood that i'm really good in blog posts for example how you behave how you make people open to you uh, how because soldier uh, he's always expecting some danger on the blog post and when you are passing you have to be really ukrainian you have to be really like a friend of him uh, like a friend of his childhood and it's what really usually happens so i got these experiences one by one i had difficult situations at the beginning sometimes but then i understood how it works and how to be mm, the most effective in this work so if it's never uh, education i think it's just a style uh, of uh, a person uh, it's like behavior open qualities mm, ability to be open mm, to be close to people uh, that's what makes fixer a good fixer yes everything is imper empiric empiric uh, the experience makes me a fixer by the way uh, stressful situations uh, you have to be very calm like a soldier too mm, when a situation is stressful you have to act proactive and uh, not uh, being really scared and not being really stressed i tried i tried to avoid all the feelings during the work uh, first when it's danger it's very useful not to feel anything about that and second uh, when somebody struggling uh, i can't i'm sure i'm in his emotions i open to people i cry together with people but i i can't be really hurt by it and I have to be really strong with that because um, somebody can get uh, a depression after like one interview, one, two hour interview with a man who was tortured. Uh, somebody can like go out from this work. So that's why I maybe in some way I block my heart from being hurt by their stories because I have so many stories. Um, what are the dangers of being in the front line? The most part of people, civilians and soldiers, are injured by Russian artillery. So maybe that's the uh, most dangerous thing because artillery distance is up to 40 kilometers. So the 40 kilometers near front line seems to be the most dangerous place, uh, especially in places that are regularly shoot. Mm, sometimes uh, the goal of Russian artillery or rockets is uh, the military goal, but sometimes uh, that are not military goals. That's just uh, they are just terrorizing uh, civilians, uh, and that's uh, yeah really scary and really bad thing. So the biggest danger is to be shot by artillery to get into a shooting. Luckily, I was never mm, being in the shooting. Like they never shoot like five meters or. 50 meters away from me, maybe, I don't know, 300, 500 meters. I've heard from different volunteers that people who got in shooting really was shoot and had to hide in basement, just under shooting, etc. They have totally different psychology from those who just went to the front line many times. So after they were in shooting, they have, they need some uh, psychological work, uh, psychological help, etc. So I can't say about their experience. Luckily, like the biggest danger for me was maybe 300, 500 meters away from me, artillery shooting. Uh, but uh, maybe I will tell uh, my um, biggest danger situation. It's when you go to a front line to soldier positions, uh, you pass some roads that can be shoot, easily shoot by Russians. And on that road, you have to be very fast, like 100 kilometers and faster. It can be a field road, but you go and you're open to the front line and uh, they can easily shoot you. Uh, and on that road, I broke my tire and I had to cope with the situation. First, I hide to the bush. We were two cars, me with my press, uh, uh, German and Hong Kong guy. And there is another team uh, of press with the press officer who is a soldier who made the permission for us to come here. Uh, 
So we, I broke my tire and I fastly uh, hide it to the bush to change the tire. I did everything very like strict, uh, very sober mind. Like, okay, I have to do that now very fast. But then the press officer on the other car comes back to see us and screams, what the fuck are you doing here? We will all die now here. Run very fast to our car. And I very fastly put my um, press to their car. They ran away. And then I drived without a wheel, not without a wheel, without a tire, uh, like for 15 minutes on this uh, dangerous road. And uh, yeah, I didn't expect that car can go without a wheel. And I didn't know that I will be so good in this driving because it's quite dangerous. But luckily, everything is fine. I even found a tire in that frontline village, uh, a new tire. So I was really lucky, thankful to God. Are you are you scared of of mines? Uh, are there mines uh, where you you go or you drive or it's? Tell me. Yeah. Also, that doesn't show me like a good fixer. But I will tell you a story of the beginning of war. Uh, we started to explore Bucha and Irpin, and we uh, and there were huge traffic jams. Like to get into Kiev and back from Bucha, you needed two hours because all the bridges were broken. And we went, uh, like, I asked my press guys, are you afraid, guys, to go with the field uh, around the road to pass the jam? And they said, no, no, we are not afraid of mines. Okay. But everything was, was dangerous in that region around Kiev. And we went and I did these things, uh, went through the fields, etc., because I expected that how many mines are there in Kiev, like 700, 1000, and this big territory, no, it's a very small chance to die. But then I read, in May, uh, there was the mining of 28,000 of mines only in Kiev region and only on May. And then I understood, wow, that was really dangerous <laughs> what I did before. So I started to be like more calm with this scene and not to risk if there is no need in this risk. Okay. And uh, by the way, I've seen uh, soldiers that died on the mine just like five minutes before me and it was very crazy emotions the emotions of other soldiers uh many were screaming uh, it felt like felt like they didn't control themselves at that moment and there are people with guns who don't control their emotions because they just lost their friend yeah it's very scary thing what precaution do you take to ensure your safety um in your work yes uh, for sure i have to control the map where I drive, I have to understand the situation. Better not to use, and they write, uh, we have like official deep state map, it's a map of frontline, but they write, never use this map to make your trips on the frontline, because uh, this map is different, <laughs> really, from the real battle situation. Uh, so that's why you have to make your own decision if you want to go um, to the place where a fight can start, where, where the attack can start. Uh, for sure, on the front line, we wear bullet jackets and helmets, and we have the first aid. Luckily, I have never used it. For example, uh, Russians can say that they took one village, and Ukrainians say, no, Russians lie, they didn't take this village. But that means that there are big fights in this village. So probably if Russians say we are going to take this village, you shouldn't go there. But uh, I met many journalists who really want to go and they really want to go and shoot real fights. It's some like crazy guys. I know some Hong Kong, Hong Kong guy, Kaoru, and he was shot before working with me. Uh, he was shot with artillery and his fixer was injured. Uh, it's a popular story his story and he has a video when when they were shoot Ah. 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 Ah.
His arm is okay. His arm is okay. okay. No need to. No need to. Release the blood. And uh, it's also much more serious than it seems to be because I've I understood like I thought from that video, maybe that's like he, he's injured like he uh, hardly dropped from a bicycle. Uh, it's how I felt. It. But when I asked Kaworu. What is with the picture now? It was four months after the accident, and he couldn't move his right part of the body uh, when uh, artillery shoot like five meters from him. So it's a really bad scene. Um, yeah, and I'm every day. I, I'm more and more careful with my work, and I think more and more about the safety scenes and about choosing a place to go, about my plan. Because uh, you, mm, as a press uh, and as a picture, I have to help him to make his work. And he has to make uh, like his picture. And sometimes a picture or video or story. And sometimes you can find a better story in a less dangerous place. So sometimes you understand that you need to go because uh, that is now mm, the middle of the world. Like the Kherson occupation, for example. Everybody went very fast to her son to show the world what happens there and it was very reasonable uh, but sometimes you just don't have a reason to risk your life because you have mm, an opportunity to make another story that is much less risky but not worse as a fixer can you become a target um, because you you help um, journalists from other countries is that Dangerous. Uh, I'm uh, basically I'm a journalist. I became a journalist too. Uh, I have a military accreditation to get the accesses to different places. So I need to be a journalist. So as first months of my fixed work, I got this accreditation. So I'm like mm, totally journalist. And uh, by the way, I make my own videos, as you could see. And uh, uh, I look like a journalist. So what I think about the danger for journalists in total. Uh, there can be, as everywhere, of course, Ukrainians think that all Russians are crazy and all Russians are bad, but I understand that it's not true. And there are normal people, basic, maybe even kind people among Russians, and there are crazy uh, without any brain who can uh, like look at the sniper gun and uh, it can be just fun for him to kill civilians or something like that. I can see like, how it happens. Killing civilians and killing press. So we can never expect who is that man, who, who is a human inside that soldier. So is he just coming with the propaganda of Russia to defend from Nazi uh, and he fights just against the military? Or he is just a killer who just enjoys killing people. So if it is somebody who enjoys killing people, and it's very bad, I think, that these people are in army. Uh, so uh, journalists can be in danger. But usually professional journalists try to wear the blue helmets, the blue jackets uh, to differ from military. And um, normal soldier will understand, okay, it's press. I don't kill press. I'm not a killer. I don't want any more kills in my life. I only make my work. But uh, somebody can be just crazy, and there are many of them in Russia. And somebody can think that foreign press is something bad, but I think it's a very rare situation because mostly I hear that mm, Russian soldiers even don't understand why they came here. Uh, they don't understand the reason. They w are very surprised with the level of life in our villages and cities. Even in villages, we have roads. They see these beautiful houses of people, the beautiful gardens, and they understand that they are coming and they are just destroying. They feel pity. Many of them feel very bad about they came here. It's what I hear in, from my interviews. Mm, so I would not expect this kind of soldiers 
uh, who feel bad um, and who feel pity uh, that they came to Ukraine, I don't feel that they can be danger for press. Uh, mostly, mostly, uh, for example, even from Bucha, uh, a girl from Bucha told me that they were just shooting windows because they are afraid to be killed. They are afraid that some soldier is sitting in some house and will kill them. Mm, so that's why they are shooting the windows of civilian houses. Uh, so all the cases of death, not all, but many of them, uh, just because of the fear of Russians to be killed. So when we see uh, when they take 15 men and just kill 15 men, that's not because uh, they have the pleasure from killing people. I think mostly it's because they feel scared to be killed by this man. How did journalists get in touch with you? Uh, they can find me in the chats. We have chats for fixers where everybody asks for help. And uh, like sometimes some journalists can write, I need a fixer for these dates for this kind of work, etc. But then he gets 20 or 30 fixers who write to him and wants this um, work. So that's why well, here as a fixer work starts in the sales, you have to sell your um, services and it's really difficult. Uh, but in total, I think there are like 200, maybe maximum 300 really like working fixers in Ukraine, in all over Ukraine, because we have like one main chat, which one uh, nice press officer from Mikolaev and Kherson uh, invented. And he offers fixers who ever uh, was in touch with him. He adds these fixers to this group chat. And I understand that everybody uh, get in touch with him during the fixer work. And this is a chat for 300 people. So I understand that there are not so many really working fixers okay mostly i found my fixers in chats also my friends colleagues fixers uh, giving me some work sometimes when they have more requests than they need uh, and uh, sometimes uh, one journalist tells another journalist about me uh, also i know that uh, my colleagues can write directly to media uh, to foreign media and to offer their services uh, i never done this because my goal is to work up to 10 days per month, and then I have 20 days for music. But believe me, when you go for 10 days to the front line, you feel it like half a year uh, sa sailor. <laughs> so <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's much easier than to work 20 days on ordinary job. What is the relationship between journalists and fixers? Here, I think everything depends from people. For me, uh, they were always good people and uh, we had always very good relationships. Uh, I don't uh, think that everybody has the same case, but with me, from the first um, chatting, I feel the interest of uh, the journalist to Ukraine. I feel his interest in his work and I respect the professionals. Um, so I And I try to find the orders that would be interesting for me. Uh, I never worked in like a big team of press that have the task. There's some, sometimes the press is like a big car with two securities, driver separately, photographer separately, mm. interviewer, uh, writer, etc. But I never worked in these big teams because they are for me like not flexible. Uh, for me, the best is to work with one journalist. And we are very fast, we can move very fast, we can make decisions by ourselves, etc. Uh, so for me, it was very hard, heartful relations. They, most of them say, my friend, my friend to me, like I was like their friend in Ukraine and they invite me to see Italy or Germany or Norway, etc. Uh, so my relationship is very good, but for sure, I've heard many bad stories. Uh, I heard about... Uh, some arguments, uh, like some uh, some press that uh, is not satisfied with their fixers and some fixers that are very angry on their press. Maybe even some uh, press who tries to make some pro-Russian context to the information that they, they get. But for me, all they were nice and pro-Ukrainian, for sure. Do you feel responsible for the journalists you bring with you uh, to the front line? Yes, I'm like also a security. Maybe this work that I make, fixer is very easy to remember and to understand, but it consisted, of, for me, it consisted of driving, security, translator, interviewing, uh, helping like a local producer. I'm helping to make the story and even like some imagination scenes. 
Sometimes I try to make their story more interesting than it is. So it's all in one work. And uh, yes, security is a part of it. And I feel responsible. And when that stressed situation uh, happened, I understood that my work is like the first priority is his safety and only then mine. I don't know why. Maybe it's just uh, true <laughs> to act like that because it's my work, because I took this responsibility on me. So yes, I would say that I feel responsible for them. Alors j'ai malheureusement oublié de relancer l'enregistrement sur Zoom, mais finalement c'est peut-être l'occasion de pouvoir vous montrer des dizaines d'images filmées par Rost lorsqu'il était sur le front. How do you feel when you see articles published that come from your work with foreign journalists? Mm, I feel very nice uh, and it makes me full of energy for the next day. Uh, I will tell just one experience. It was uh, working with a uh, German famous photographer, Hannibal, and uh, he made really great uh, shootings. And uh, we worked like since nine in the morning till three in the uh, afternoon. And then he's uh, like making his photos on the laptop. And after six, they are all over the world. Washington Post, Guardian, New York Times, I don't know. And uh, he is like a child. He's so nice man. He's so like open with his uh, feelings. And he's like, oh, look, look, they published, they published my photo. And he's so happy with that. And I get the part of his happiness and I feel really, and he's always saying, uh, it's only sent to you, Ross. We made this job, we're uh, like a team, we make it together. And uh, I was really, Thankful for this experience with him because we working with professional we worked like 17 days um, together and I felt like uh, like tired like after three days working just because I had the energy every day getting it from the results of the work and from his attitude to my work and from his attitude to his work. So y your job is to uh, also to translate um, the conversation between the population and the journalists. First of all, um, do you speak Ukrainian? And Russian, because if if you need to to speak with people from uh, the, all the places in in, in Ukraine, you might need uh, to speak both. Tell me. Yes, that's a good question, and that's a really good point. A good fixer has to be fluent in both languages. I'm from Kriveri, the same city as our president. From it's in central Ukraine. It was totally Russian-speaking city, and it was pro Yanukovych uh, in 2013. But uh, I uh, know Ukrainian fluently. Uh, because it was Ukrainian school, Ukrainian teachers, then Kiev Mohila Academy is the best university of Ukraine uh, and best uh, about making you a patriot of Ukraine uh, because it has some good Ukrainian propaganda inside <laughs> and it makes you love Ukrainian and know Ukrainian. So I'm very fluently change from language to language and in front line you really need a Russian language to speak with people on East uh, and I can't imagine how Uh, Western Ukrainian uh, speaking guy like Stepan, for example, uh, how he could speak on the East, uh, it would be much more difficult for him to make the contact because people, uh, they have their house hit by rockets, they don't want to speak with you. And you come and speak Ukrainian to them, you are a stranger to them, they don't want to open to a stranger. But when you come, like you live in the neighbor house and you come to ask, Oh, like you are from Donetsk and I'm from Kriverich, it's like a f friendly city uh, and they uh, it's much easier for them to open and and they feel it's not only about language it's even about style I don't know another world <laughs> style and mood how you feel the realities of Ukraine to be honest the big problem is for me is Ukrainian people are very different in all the regions We are a very big country. We can't, 40 million of people can't be the same. They, they can't have the same views. They can't have the same heroes. And it's now the problem of Ukraine that mm, some people think that we have to have everything like mono, uh, mono heroes, mono history, mono beliefs. But for me, I see what I can see from the different regions of Ukraine that it's impossible to collect everybody around one idea. So having one idea doesn't have to be our main thing. We have to say that we are different. We are Ukrainians. We are Russian-speaking Ukrainians. We are Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians. And uh, we are workers on factories. And we are workers who is on mountains with ships. And we are those who make clothes. And we are those who make startups and business. But we have to understand each other, to understand the necessity of each other and to accept 
each other. For me, that's a way to build a strong country. I hope that we will change to that direction and not uh, start being very nationalistic inside and fighting uh, between people inside. So, <laughs> regarding to your question, uh, yeah, I speak both languages with people. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happens during the conversation with the population? Uh, so, if we go and try to find people, I just start conversations on the streets. Uh, people, mostly, they are very open to you because they see uh, some uh, people that are strangers and uh, they came, they speak English. Uh, it's interesting for them, it's like exotic. So, they are very open to tell their stories and uh, they are also can expect some help, some help from uh, this person now and some help from his work. But maybe I will tell you one story that we met in uh, Donbass uh, region, not far from front line, just after 10 days after liberation of that village. We met a man there and he told us the story that when Russians came, uh, I think it was like four months ago, uh, they killed his son. He just didn't come back at the first days of Russian Russians coming in. And he is a 70 years old man, uh, was uh, going, walking in the fields for two months and a half. And finally he found his son in some trench, uh, dead son. But uh, Russians didn't allow them. Uh, he, he told They told him that... Uh, his mind, so you can't bury him. Uh, you, you can try, but he's probably mine. And he was very afraid. Uh, he couldn't take him by himself, and he didn't want to ask anybody for help because it's dangerous to be blown by the mind. He made many strategies how to save his son. He even made a trip for a car to come to take him away from there. Uh, and then Ukrainians came, they checked that he is not mine, and they said, You can bury him, but we will take him out and unbury because we will need to make expertise. Uh, and he said, okay, let him lay there. And I asked, where is the son now? And he says, yeah, he's still there. I will show you. And he took us to the place through the fields. We went and we saw his dead son after four months in the trench. And he was very open to tell the story. He wanted to show his ex. Uh, this man is 70-year-old ex-Soviet uh, soldier, and for him it's very disappointing what the uh, Russian army is doing now here, and he wanted to tell his story. It was, for sure, it was very scary, it was a big um, pain to him, but he wanted the um, world to know about that. I don't think that we need to hate, that uh, hate can help us. Somebody says that hate is our strength, strength strong part, uh, but I don't agree with that because I understand that human has a beautiful ability to love and love is opposite to hate. So when you allow yourself to hate, to be full of hate, you are avoiding love. Even if you have this hate to Russians who bomb your city and media are telling that there are so many rockets, that there are so many killed people, but you have this hate and you uh, then it goes somewhere, it goes to your family, it goes to your work, it goes somewhere inside. Uh, and it's not very good for Ukraine, inside Ukraine. I, I don't say that we have to forgive Russians, but I say that we have to kill them without hate, just with a strict mind, a sober mind, like on the front line, uh, on the front line when I have a dangerous situation, I have to be sober, I have to be very self-confident and not hateless, not like, oh, I'm so angry on these Russians, they shoot to me now, oh, I have to be, I, I hate them. No, 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 never. I have to do what I have to do. And that I want to advise to all Ukrainians and all people and all Europeans to do, not to hate, just do your work good and help Ukraine to win. Merci beaucoup d'avoir regardé cette vidéo. Merci encore à Rost d'avoir partagé son expérience en tant que fixeur. Si cette vidéo vous a plu, n'hésitez pas à la liker, à la commenter, à la partager. Vous pouvez aussi vous abonner à ma chaîne YouTube, ça me ferait très plaisir. Et moi je vous dis à dimanche prochain. Bisous